introduce our next guest because he and I share so much in common. For one thing, we both view life from a slightly less than average height. And for another, as you know, I'm naturally a quiet, shy, retiring person. <laughs> yes, I am. And so is he. And here he is speaking to us from New York, Jackie Mason. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you what a thrill it is to have this opportunity to talk to you in Britain about the great occasion that you're celebrating tonight. This is one of the most beautiful occasions for His Royal Highness's 50th birthday. I want to tell you the truth. I am grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. Why I'm grateful, I don't know, because I wasn't even invited to the party. I know it's going to be a fantastic party, but nobody has the decency to say to me, why don't you come over? You know what they told me? Why don't you wait for nothing? <laughs> tell jokes, because it's his party. How come the prince in all sincerity, never did nothing for me. I had a lot of birthdays, I never heard from him. I never called him up to tell him that he should talk for my birthday without being invited. I know after the party, you're all gonna go and eat, and you'll all be eating for nothing, and I'm gonna have to go out for a cafeteria and see if I got a few dollars for a cup of coffee. I'm not complaining, but is this fair? Every time I hear from the royal family, I'm doing a royal command performance for nothing. Five royal command performances, not a nickel. Every time I hear from England, I think I'm talking to Israel because Israel is accustomed to asking Jews to work for nothing, but I never know that England is in the same business. But this has nothing to do with the fact that I want to pay tribute to Prince Charles. He's a great man. Anybody who could get a man like me to work for these prices is a genius. 
God bless you, and God bless your country, and I hope you have a great evening, even though you're leaving me out. And good night. Ladies and gentlemen, Samantha Janus. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, I've tried for years to entice the next artist round for a quiet candlelit dinner for two, but I've always hit two big problems. I can't work out how to get him on his own, and two, I don't have a large enough table. You know he's certain to bring with him film stars, sporting heroes, and a few politicians if you're unlucky, or even his Royal Highness. Because the next artist is the most talented of impressionists. And here, with his look back at the last 50 years of British sport, please welcome the multi-talented Alistair McGowan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Your Royal Highness. Uh, thank you for having me. Very nice to be here. Some of us were just chatting, actually, uh, sports-wise, about uh, who we thought were the best footballers of the last 50 years. Some people thought Stanley Matthews, other people said Bobby Moore, and a few said Kenny Dalgleish, and I'm sure that Peter Beardsley, for one, would agree with them, because Beardsley recently said, Yeah, well, you know, Kenny, uh, you know, he was obviously <laughs> a Kenny, to be fair, and uh, I'll always remember, to be fair, to Kenny, a piece of advice that he gave me, you know, and uh, I remember he called me one day, and he said to me, uh, Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, you over here, aren't you? <laughs> I don't know what he said, but I'll always remember him giving me the advice anyway. David Beckham, of course, is the pick of the modern players, and Beckham never seems to be out of the headlines, does he? Either because of his football or because of his personal life. Yeah, that's right, um, but, um... <laughs> uh, yeah, the well, thing is, like, me and Victoria, you know, we're just like any ordinary people, really. Uh, except that I always sound like I've only just learned how to talk, but... <laughs> But we are, you know, and we like to laugh and a joke like anyone else. Like the other day, I, I, I went up to her and I poured like a whole jar of oregano over her head. And she said, what'd you do that for? I said, I wanted to spice up my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but he seems now at least to have got over his World Cup disappointment, as indeed does Glenn Hoddle. Though Glenn Hoddle said his one regret about the World Cup, I'm sure you read this, was not taking Eileen Drury, the faith healer, with him to France. Yeah, you know, a lot of people have been asking about Eileen. <laughs> They want to know what exactly it is she does for the players, you know, when uh, basically Eileen's situation is that uh, if any of the players have an injury, you know, she'll cure the injury by uh, laying her hands on him, you know, like so. Uh, when Paul Lintz had a bad ankle, she put her hand on his ankle, you know, when uh, Darren Anderton had a bad hamstring, she put her hand on it. And uh, when Les Ferdinand had a groin strain, um, I got him some painkillers. <laughs> Of course, the last time we won the World Cup was 1966. The Prince was 17 years old, I'm sure you remember it well, sir. And Jack Charlton, of course, was a member of that side. That's right. Now listen, people say to me, they say that I cannot remember things. I say, I've got a dodgy memory. Can't remember players' names and things like that. Can't remember anything. But I remember that World Cup final like it was yesterday. Like it was yesterday. Every detail. It was July the 30th, 1966. We beat West Germany 4-2. And them three goals that that Lee Hurst scored were brilliant. I tell you. <laughs> of course, if you want to be good at sport, you've got to be confident. Unless you're a boxer, in which case, of course, you've got to be mad. They are all mad. The latest mad boxer, Prince Nazim. Yeah, I'm the best, you know, I'm the best. I'm the best at everything that I do, innit? I'm the best at boxing, I'm the best at training, I'm the best at standing here, I'm the best at talking to you, I'm the best at having ears that stick out quite a long way. <laughs> I'm the best at being from Sheffield, I'm the best at eating parking, I'm the best at parking, I'm the best at talking about me and I'm the best at saying that I'm the best. I'm the best at thinking that everybody else thinks that I'm the best and I'm the best person at using the word best, innit? I even say the word best, the best, best that even done up George Best, innit? People said that he was the best, but he was just G-Best and I am the best, yes. <laughs> The ultimate sporting occasion, though, of course, is the Olympic Games. Last stage in this country in 1948, the year, of course, in which the Prince was born, and uh, he won the pole vault, which I thought was quite an achievement. But um, <laughs> last time around, of course, we didn't do so very well, and everyone has their theories now on how we can do better. Even the comic Eddie Izzard recently said, um, yes, um, <laughs> basically, uh, oh. Um, no, uh, if I want more medals, if we want more medals, if we want more medals, then what they should do, what they should do, what they should do. <laughs> they should have more medals, have more medals, we get more medals. What have we got at the moment? Only three medals, gold, silver, bronze. You've got to come first, you've got to come second, you've got to come third. Oh, tricky. <laughs> But if they had more medals, hey, when our guy comes 53rd in the cycling, instead of us going, oh, 53rd, 
Ooh. They go, yes, but he won the paper medal. Hooray! It'll be groovy. David Coleman saying, right, well, let's uh, look now at the final medal sale. Great Britain there. Gold, uh, nothing. Silver, nothing. Bronze, one. Copper, 13. Uh, tin, 23. Uh, aluminium, 26. Zinc, 16. Styrofoam, oh, oh, oh! 38. <laughs> Wood 34, Balsa Wood 34, and uh, what's that there? Uh, uh, SMDF, David. Thanks very much, Handy Andy, there uh, for that little. Uh... <laughs> but finally, 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 one of the most prestigious events in the sporting calendar in this country is still the FA Cup final. Now, every year, there'll be a member of the Royal Family at the Cup final. They go down the line, shaking hands with all the players before the game starts. Have a little word here, a little word there, then they stop for a long time and chat to one player. And I've always thought, what are they saying to that one player? And the other year, the prince himself did the job, and I lip-read him, and what happened was this. It's a jolly good luck. Well done, beginnings of far. It's a jolly good luck, yes. Well done, beginnings of far. Yeah. Jolly good luck, yes. Awfully well done, beginnings of far. Jolly good luck. Now, look, what you've got to do, you've got to push your full backs up, get into the channels, get your crosses in the middle, pass the loop, get into the middle, get in 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 the middle, after the break, Stephen Fry, Ulrika Johnson, Greg Fruits, the two fat ladies, and Spike Milligan on a royal celebration. Rock and roll. Then our next guest, for certain, is the Buddy Holly of witty one-liners, as he regularly demonstrates on whose line is it anyway, and with the comedy store players. Now, when I travelled across the Black Sea, from Sweden, of course, to the lovely United Kingdom, I found gladiators instead of Vikings <laughs> and shooting stars in place of the Northern Lights. Now this man has not only crossed the Atlantic Ocean, he's embraced all of your English eccentricities and may I tell you, you are weird. In true US style and has made a dollar or two out of talking about them. Please welcome from the United States of America, Greg Proops. gentlemen correct me if i'm wrong but you know i'm not this is not a service oriented nation i'll take your stony sullen silence as an affirmation of what i said <laughs> let me put it this way till i came here i thought faulty towers was like a comedy show <laughs> now i realize it's a hard-hitting documentary <laughs> It's different in my country. Say do you go to the United States and you buy groceries, right? You're in the States, you bought your groceries, they're sitting on the counter, they're bought. The guy behind the counter takes your groceries and puts them in a bag for you. <laughs> now, stay with me, because this is where it goes completely out of control. <laughs> takes the bag out to your car, puts it in your car. Thanks a lot, have a nice day, bye-bye. Now I know what you're thinking. Well, you're fat, lazy, and indolent, aren't you? No wonder you invade other countries. You want to bring them back to America and make them your grocery bagging slaves. <laughs> Not like here. You buy your groceries, they're sitting on the counter. The person behind the counter takes a plastic carrier bag and throws it at you. <laughs> you have your money, you make us sick, now go. <laughs> God, this job is beneath me. I'm really a playwright. <laughs> Let's talk about something you do very well. Drinking, ladies and gentlemen. British people drink like someone is going to take it away from them. <laughs> people will do anything to get booze here, like there's going to be a worldwide embargo. People will take a train to a boat, to a train, go all the way to France, not even look at anything in France. <laughs> You're way ahead of me on this. <laughs> buy all the lager they can stagger under. <laughs> daddy, daddy, it hurts. <laughs> Shut up, Carrie. A train to a boat to a train all the way back to England without having looked at France. Hey, Nigel, what was France like? Who? We locked two crates of lager, wasn't it? Why didn't you just go to the off-license on your street? 40p savings, mate. <laughs> Now, I have another theory, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know I'm not. 
people on this island are a tad, a smidgen, a jot, an iota, a scintilla, just a little <laughs> more cynical than Americans. <laughs> and yeah, I'll take your muted, hateful laughter as an affirmation of what I said. <laughs> Not cynical, mate. Realistic. <laughs> Disney World is my case in point. People from this island flock to Disney World, and they always hate it. Why? Because you're from here. <laughs> I've asked a million people here, mostly Londoners, who, of course, bring that gay joie de vivre to every day's living. <laughs> Been to Disney World. What? Yeah. yeah no. Too bloody wrong. Yeah. What'd you think? <laughs> well, it's crap, isn't it? <laughs> of course it is. How could it compare to Blackpool? <laughs> there could never be as many condoms floating gently by <laughs> as you dodge the syringes on the beach. <laughs> Honey, cannon and ball are on in five minutes. Let's get going. <laughs> Everyone there is polite. You guys hate that. <laughs> You're not comfortable with American-style politeness. Have a nice day. Oh, bug off. <laughs> I'm having the kind of day I want to have. I'm having a crap day, can't you see that? I hate it here, hate it here. The sun is shining, the food is good, the people are friendly. I want to go home. <laughs> Bugger off, Pocahontas. Everyone who works there is polite, so where do they build one? Paris. <laughs> you expect too much. The place is shallow, plastic, and artificial. We're Americans. <laughs> and what's the problem? An American goes there, sees a giant mouse, you know. <laughs> no. Wait a minute. Hey, you got, I'll be a son of a... Come here, come here. Look, 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 look. You guys, giant mouse. <laughs> Dude, he really lives here. <laughs> this is the happiest place on earth. <laughs> People from this island go, and because of your natural cynicism, you suss it out in a second. Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, I must apologize for a slight hold-up in proceedings. Our next act is Circus Oz once described as the most dangerous thing ever to come out of Australia. Unfortunately, because the act is so dangerous, the safety people have sent along excuse an me, expert... Excuse me, look, what? we'll just have to hold the concert for a minute now. What? Just have to measure the board. It doesn't look quite long enough. Oh, if you could just bear with us, thank you. Okay. Okay, you people out there can talk amongst yourselves. Just be a minute. Hold up your very special night. All right. Just measure this damn board and get on with the show. All right. <sighs> Well, uh, maybe I'll do that again. I don't think you can expect the government to get it right first time. Right. <laughs> now, I'm afraid that's far too short. Lucky I'm from the government, because I will do it in triplicate. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe it ain't so short after all. All right.
needs no safety checks. For over 50 years, he's been making more people laugh longer and louder than anyone else in this theatre tonight, and that's saying something. Now, here he is saying something to us from his home in the country, Mr. Spike Milligan. Oh, 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 uh, happy, happy, happy what? Happy birthday, happy birthday to who? Who? Uh, Prince Charles. Happy, happy birthday, Prince Charles. Uh, um, oh, you, you didn't invite me to your birthday party. You swine! <laughs> Here, who is that snoring in that frock? That's the... <laughs> that's the new sound. Yeah. It's, it's is it Fender? <laughs> It's, it's Neddy. He thinks he's, he thinks he's the Queen of England. There <laughs> goes. Yep. Let us play a game and push him down the well. Yeah. <laughs> The letter. The day the letter arrived, I was due in court on an intricate and puzzling case which was coming to a delicate and potentially explosive stage. The letter then came as a welcome diversion, and I tipped the delivery boy out of the window with more than ordinary generosity. <laughs> the letter read as follows. If Mr. John Lawson Particle will travel immediately to Transylvania as the honored guest of Count Dracula to personally advise His Excellency on a matter of great legal delicacy, Mr. Lawson Particle will be handsomely remunerated. He is to bring on his journey no garlic, no crucifixes, no wooden stakes. Neither is he to look up in a dictionary the word vampire. It seemed innocent enough. <laughs> Excited at the prospect of escaping a dreary London August, I rushed into Mr. Tulkinghorn's office. He read the letter through and eyed me carefully. Then he looked at my face. <laughs> you don't find anything strange in this letter, Mr. Lawson Particle? Ah, you noticed it too, sir, the split infinitive in the first sentence, yes. <laughs> no, I was thinking, never mind. What are you working on at the moment? I am retained in the case of the London Rubber Company versus the Vatican, sir. <laughs> well, I dare say you can be spared. As to the letter, you want to go on this suicide, on this fascinating mission? <laughs> With your permission, sir, I will go straight home, dress, and take the first train to Southampton. <laughs> Four days later, saw me standing at the gates of Castle Dracula, weary and travel-stained. Prudence had demanded that I leave her behind, so I was alone. <laughs> 
The journey through Eastern Europe had passed pleasantly enough. I'd picked up a little German on a previous visit, and he and I had met up again at Regensburg. <laughs> now, night was just falling as I knocked on the mighty oaken door and heard the answering echoes ring through the castle. After what seemed a cliché, iron bolts were drawn back, the portal swung open, and Count Dracula's manservant stood before me. Of all the hideous spectacles I have ever beheld, those perched on the end of this man's nose <laughs> remain forever pasted into the album of my memory. Bowing low, this loathsomely disfigured wretch introduced himself. Travolta, sir. <laughs> At your servile. If you will follow me, I shall tell the master you have arrived. Walking with a pronounced limp, L-I-M-P, pronounced limp. <laughs> he showed me into a waiting room. Sorry, into a waiting room. <laughs> I vanished. Presently, he returned with his master. Ah, Mr. Lawson Particle, welcome to Castle Dracula. Dinner is in half an hour. Travolta will show you to your room. Tell me, what blood type are you? A. I said, what blood type are you? <laughs> oh, I said, B. <laughs> I tried to question Travolta as to the nature of the Count's business as I dressed for dinner, but he made the sign of the cross and said nothing. I asked him why there were no mirrors in the castle, but this time he made the sign of the very cross indeed and spat. <laughs> this was puzzling. I couldn't see myself spending a month in a house without mirrors. <laughs> the man was either mad or both. <laughs> Capon for dinner, sir, said Travolta as we descended the vast stairway. Capon, yummy, I replied. No, sir, the Count always insists that his guests put a cape on for dinner. <laughs> and what a dismal repast it was. My client was not eating, his diet forbade it. Instead, he quaffed greedily at a goblet of his tonic, a thick red liquid, which reminded me forcibly of some kind of wine. Travolta stood at my shoulder with a bottle of the liquid. Mac on, sir? What, on top of this cape, I'll suffocate. <laughs> I passed a fitful night in my vast bedroom. Below me, I could hear the Count's footsteps echoing in the hallway. The wind whistled all through the night and other Welsh hymns. <laughs> I arose early, made my toilet, sat on it, and then came down to breakfast. <laughs> it was a dreary morning. The greatest excitement I had to look forward to was the prospect of a total eclipse of the sun, which was expected during the afternoon. I whiled away the morning hours in the Count's garden. The only note of beauty or hope in this melancholy wilderness came from the flowers. I stooped to pick a buttercup. Why people leave buttocks lying around, I've no idea. <laughs> For the eclipse came. I watched through a fragment of smoked glass as the moon slid slowly over the surface of the sun and darkness shrouded the earth. I started at a sound behind me. By the dim light of a candle I had prudently placed on the table, I could see that it was Count Dracula, my client. He seemed a little excited. A tendril of spaghetti appeared to be protruding from either side of his mouth. Why, good afternoon, Count, I cried. I wasn't expecting you until this evening. Have you come to enjoy the spectacle? Spectacle? A solar eclipse. He looked out of the window. Solar eclipse? Yes, it's the first total eclipse I've ever seen. Exciting, isn't it? Oh, shit. <laughs> is there something wrong, Count? You look a little unwell. How much longer is it going to last, he cried, and I could see fear in his blood-red eyes. 
Well, it's just ending now, I, I replied. Look at that, splendid, isn't it? I turned in time to watch the moon moving slowly away from the sun and light once more flooding the scene. Have you ever seen anything so... Oh, Count? But he had disappeared, leaving his cape behind him. In his hurry, he must have upset the ashtray on the floor beside it. <laughs> I never saw him again. Still to come, Robbie Williams, Vinnie Jones, Celeste Patterson and Jerry Halliwell in the spectacular finale of A Royal Celebration.